Hey, welcome back to Driven Channel, and I have here a, uh, a good friend of mine, special guest. Uh, we've known each other for such a long time. Always supported me in my events since day one, since the first one. So uh, really, really uh, proud of everything you're doing, Dan. I know a lot of people that follow me know you already. Who, who doesn't know you at this point? Uh, I noticed that you're getting, like, you're just blowing up right now, like getting, like, huge and huge and huge, like all these things that you're getting into you're buying all these businesses uh you you know all these people and and you're just moving at a way faster speed than than what i've seen uh and every year just keeps getting crazier uh and i know now you're now you're a you're a father to be yeah uh yeah. so a lot of exciting things going on a lot of action uh what what are you more excited about right now I feel like I can see the matrix right now. Like the events are doing really well with the Spire Tour. The Ever Bowls are opening left and right. Like Cars and Coffee is expanding. Each of the businesses, I'm not trying to take anything new on. I'm trying to expand the things that I have and really scale them. But I can. F I feel like I can see it now because I, I know where the problems are. I know where the drama is. I know what's good, who's, who's bad. I know so many people in the industry, so I know who to work with to s do things quicker and faster, more effectively. And so just right now I'm in that zone and what you're seeing is just math and time compounds, right? I'm just doing a lot of stuff going 100, 150, 200, 250 places a year with my phone out and other people's phones out, it just compounds. And if I'm speaking everywhere, just like you're speaking everywhere, if I'm doing podcasts, you're doing podcasts, like the reason we're both growing so fast is we're, everyone just keeps posting about us, right? And so if you're meeting people all the time at events, people are posting about you, you're jumping on your own podcast, doing other people's podcasts, doing your own stages, jumping on other stages, math and time compounds. And that's why you're seeing it just kind of bl blow up now. Yeah, so I, I think elevator, your elevator nights, yeah. you, when your smaller events that were free, yeah. when did those start? So we're throwing our 54th one right now. So that's been over a decade. Over yeah. a decade. Yeah. So like a decade ago, did you ever imagine yourself, like your life being what it is right now in 10 years, like with all the stuff you have going on? I didn't have a timeline for it, but I had a vision for it. And I was watching Gary Vee, right? I was watching the way he was moving. We were friends, you know, bef before he was Gary Vee. Yeah. And watching him evolve, and that was what I wanted, right? Where he's building an agency, I'm building an agency. He's speaking at events, I'm speaking at events. He launched a big podcast. I was waiting and doing my moments. Think about it, I just started my podcast last year. I waited half a decade after a lot of people started the podcast to start a podcast. And so I was watching and envisioning it. So to, I guess to answer your question, I had a vision for it. I didn't know when it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. My goal was just brick by brick, brick by brick, over and over and over and over and over and over for years and years and years until I can build the big house. Yeah, because Aspire, you acquired that. I remember we were having lunch at Beverly Wilshire. Yeah. And, and you were telling me like, I gotta run, I, I'm, I'm going to the airport. <laughs> uh, and you were like, like excited, uh, in a hurry, and, but more excited. Yeah. And I remember you were telling me like, nobody, ha nobody knows yet. I'm about to make a major announcement. I just acquired uh, this this big event company that does X amount of millions, and it's like, it's the biggest one, isn't it? It's Aspire. The big, yeah, it's the biggest business tour. Yeah. And and how how does how does that work, and how did you end up buying it? So Andrew Cordell and Eddie Wilson had already started it, and they were throwing good size events all over the country, and I was speaking at some of them, and I was speaking at some of their masterminds, and then June of last summer, I bought 33% of the parent company. We did like a merger, we started helping them bring on celebrities and athletes and rappers and speakers to make it bigger. So it went from 1,200 people, 1,800, 2,200, 2,800, 3,000. A few weeks ago we had 4,000 in Dallas, like boom, 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 math and time compounds, right? If I keep adding Kevin Hart, Rick Ross, 2 Chains, Sarah Blakely, Gary Vee, I'm adding all these characters to something that's already good, right? those guys that Aspire Tour, they already had 85 employees. They already have a great event company. They already, everything was already there. I'm just adding the, the flair on top, right? I'm adding the, the spice and the, making it more exciting. And so they already had the infrastructure of a really good event. Andrew knows how to sell from stage. Eddie Wilson has sold over a billion dollars of companies. Like they already had all the things. I was just fast forwarding the success by adding on celebrities and athletes and rappers to make it bigger. How do you do the math on on how you figure out how to increase the margins. Because I know if you bring in, obviously, big names, expensive, you gotta yeah. pay them a little bit more. Oh yeah. So because, uh, like I have experience with my events, and sometimes you could, with your name, bring in speakers for free. Sure. But you can also bring in bigger speakers with more following, but you have to pay them a lot of money. Yep. How do you decide 
we're, for this event, we're gonna bring in X amount of people and we're gonna pay them X amount of money where you're still very profitable. So we have a general budget of how much we can spend on celebrities and speakers. Then we do what's called a blended average. What spots can we fill in for free? Can I ask Albert for a favor? Can I ask Bradley for a favor? Do I have to pay them sometimes? Sometimes if it's traveling, I'll pay them. If it's local, maybe they'll do it for free. That's a blended average because I have to fill in nine hours, right? So if I have X amount of dollars to spend over nine hours, who can I fill in for free? And every time I fill in a free spot, it allows me to have more budget for a bigger name, right? And so we have a blended average. Okay, we have Cole Hatter is talking about this. Jeff Fenster is talking about restaurants. Uh, Sarah Blakely is talking about this. Cody Sanchez is talking about this. We have speakers that are affordable or free that are friends of ours to speak in certain cities. And then if we're in Dallas, we'll pay Mark Cuban mid six figures, right? We'll pay Kevin Hart lots of money to be there. We can afford to spend the real money on a couple of celebrities or athletes or entertainers depending on th what's called the blended average. Can I get certain people for free and then keep my main budget the same? If I don't go over the budget, I can keep the business profitable because if I go from 1,200 to 1,800 to 2,200 to 2,800 and having three or 4,000 people at an event, but my overhead stays the same, that increases the profit. And that's the main thing I was helping do for the company. Let me help make these bigger events. You already have a good structure. Let me make these events bigger. Let's you know, allow Andrew to sell even more from stage because he's so good at selling from stage. And that'll allow it to bring the more revenue to afford to pay Rick Ross and Two Chains and these type of people. Do you think for every event you should always have a big speaker, a big name, or can you get away with having all free speakers? So elevator nights, I still fill up with all free speakers. I've mm -hmm. never paid a speaker for elevator nights. And depending on the city, I can get household names to come by. Jake Paul and Ty Lopez, a lot of guys come speak at my events for free because they know it's a free event. They're in town, it's fun. It's only for half hour or an hour, you know, like, and so sometimes you can fill up an event without spending any money. I don't spend any money on elevator nights besides production and, you know, drinks and food. And so you can fill up an event without that, but a ticketed event where you're charging like driven 200 bucks, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, three grand, 10 grand, et cetera. Having a couple people that are the lead, right? Like that one or two celebrities or huge name business person like Ed Milet, Andy Frisella, Jesse Isler, like getting a couple big names will also allow you to get other big name speakers for free yeah, or for right. discounts because they're like, oh, Ed Milet's speaking, I'd love to be there, right? Oh, you booked Bobby Castro and this person? You know, I'd like to be there too. And so it sometimes, especially for a ticketed event, if you're trying to sell tickets like Driven, because you've had 2,600 people, 3,000 people, you've had huge events, like some of the biggest in the industry, you have to have some big names because it fits for it and you have the revenue for it and it will allow for a lot of other speakers to want to be part of it and definitely will allow people to want to spend money to be VIP, speaker lunches, speaker dinners, backstage pass, whatever they can buy from you for three grand, five grand, it makes sense for them because you have these big names. Plus, if you have a big speaker that you never had before, sometimes you get a bunch of new followers because sure. they're like, oh, and then they find out, well, I, I didn't know who Albert was or Dan was. Of course. So, so on these events, I know there's a lot of other events. Uh, there's, there's a lot of events now, right? So More many. than ever? Yeah. So how do you feel about other events? And, and do you see them as like, for example, competition? Do you see them as like, I, I'm gonna have to crush them because <laughs> we, want to, we, we, we have to be the only ones? Uh, or, or like, just honestly, like, or do you feel like, you know what, there's enough people for unlimited events? What, what's your opinion on that? Because some events, I mean, truly speaking, are, are not, they're not, I, I see some events that they're not really carrying any value, sure. where they just don't have good content, good speakers that are gonna share good stuff. Yep. But then there are a lot of events that have the same speakers too. Yep. So like, why would somebody go to an event when they can see this, when they saw the same thing in another event? I don't know if that makes any sense, Absolutely. but it's a loaded question, but it, how do you feel? This question comes up a lot, yeah. and the, the, co the concept of the question comes up a lot. People think we're in competition with events. Here's how I break it down. I will promote another person's event, I will speak at their event, I'll help teach them how to fill up their event, here's why. Besides having the abundance mentality and all like the emotional good stuff, the reality is if I have 4,000 people in Dallas, Texas, who cares? There's like 12 million people there. If I have three or 4,000 people at LA Convention Center, whoop de doo it's LA, there's 18 million people here. Literally right next door, Albert could throw Driven and sell out 2,800 people and we wouldn't feel it. Everyone thinks like, oh, we're competing for the same crowd. We are, 
but there's millions of people of that crowd and we're getting 2,000, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, 4,000, 2,000. These numbers are irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. And so if all of us threw an event the exact same weekend in Las Vegas and it's Ryan Pineda's throwing WealthCon and you're throwing Driven and this guy's throwing that and Bradley's throwing an event, it would literally be irrelevant, like actually yeah. irrelevant. Because we're talking about thousands of people per event in cities that have millions of people. There's 44 million visitors a year to Las Vegas. Who cares if you've got 3,000, I got 3,000, he's got 2,000, who cares? Yeah. Yeah, well, I always ask you, when, when's your event going on? Because I don't want to throw that <laughs> <laughs> the same day. <laughs> so for, I, I, I think a little bit strategic on that. On that but I'm also, I'm always there for your event. Even yeah. my, I had my own mastermind during Driven, and I freaking left my yeah, own yeah, event to drive to you. Yeah. You know, like, I'm going to be there no matter what. Yeah. So now, Dan, for, for these events, to, to end this event uh, topic, how important are ads Ad spend. Yeah. How, how do you how do you uh, decide how much am I going to spend for this in advertising on like yep. on Facebook, TikTok, or whatever? Yep. And which is your favorite on? Wh where do you get more ticket sales from? So Instagram and Facebook work the best. LinkedIn would work well. It's just it's still not really an ad heavy platform, so it's not that great for it. Twitter has the concept for it, but it's hard to do targeting there. So really, Instagram and Facebook are the ones. TikTok obviously has great reach but not necessarily good buyers because they're not there for that they're there to just scroll and have fun and watch videos really fast so instagram and facebook is where most of your ads will live for aspire tour we spend three hundred thousand four hundred thousand five hundred thousand a month to fill up these arenas but if we're getting 2x 3x 4x row ads return on ad spend who cares right if i can spend a dollar and get back three spend as many one dollars as possible right for limitless right now in salt lake city we're getting a 4x row ads I don't mind saying these things publicly. I don't, it's, we're spending a dollar to get back four. So I tell them, spend as many $1 as possible because we get back four. Who cares, right? And so I don't have a cap. If I can spend 1000 and get back 4000 why wouldn't I spend two or three or four or 10 or sell a kidney and spend 100 Like Spend as much as possible if you're getting back 2x, 3x, and 4x. And so figuring out ad spend is really important to test the different ads of what works. Does Albert Preciado's face work on this ad? Should I have him and Sylvie on the ad? Should I have him medium size or full size or small size? Should he be wearing a pink shirt, a blue shirt, a gray shirt, or a black shirt? And literally test all those different things. I call it digging for oil. Did it work best when Albert was wearing a pink shirt, Sylvia was wearing a blue shirt? Did it work better when she was wearing purple? Like That detailed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I remember one time you got mad at me because I didn't have a girl on the ad. Yeah, I'm very mad. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not for me, it's for you. Because I don't want you to get ripped to shreds in the comments over something that's silly. It's something so fixable, and you have great women that are speaking at your events, but sometimes it's not showcased to the world. Yeah. And so then your ad won't get the same engagement that it should. Yeah. Because people are like, oh, why isn't there any women? You're like, actually, I have Sylvia. I have Sophia Castro. Like, I have great speakers, but they're just not on the ad sometimes, or there's different, different yeah. versions of flyers. And so I was just mad because I wanted to avoid you having to deal with the keyboard warriors. Yeah, keyboard warriors. So when you're spending ads, uh, when it when you're getting three bucks back instead of four bu bucks, is is that do you start getting worried, no, or at well, one point you get worried? What if you break even? I'm happy to break even. Yeah. Because I'm gonna make money from the event, right? Mm. If I can get butts in seats, like if I can get people there into the event and I broke even on it, I would do it because when they're there, they're gonna buy something, right? Whether they buy from stage, buy merch, buy products, buy books, but they're gonna buy into us. Maybe buy something later. They're gonna buy into our world. I would spend a dollar to get back one. That would be perfectly fine. But if I can spend a dollar to get back two or a dollar to get back three, I want to spend as one, many dollars as possible. So Forex is like a, an incredible... Yes, especially for an event. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know how long that's going to last, but right now I'm just telling them, spend 10000 a day. Whatever the max is, fuck, go, 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 go max yeah. it out. Whatever. But you're doing this, you're doing events every month, right? Every month? Every week. Every I'm, week? I'm no, but, but the big one. The uh, Aspire tours once a month. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I have a mastermind. We have five masterminds now with 1,100 members. And so we have a mastermind event every weekend. We have, we're throwing 42 events this year and growing. And so- You don't get tired of so many events? Oh, not yet. I like it. And when I'm there, remember, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I can see the matrix. I know this should run like this. We should put this time slots here together. I'm seeing so many events and so many schedules and run of shows and like flow that I can feel like I can answer You'll, You always seem so calm, like when you're there. And I see like others, they, like they, maybe they're, more nervous type, but I see people like 
freaking they, out. They'll, they'll sprint and the, the mic's not where it's supposed to be. Yeah. Everybody's going crazy and, and getting kind of agitated. Mm -hmm. But you always remain remain poised and so calm all the time. Is that because of the experience or you think you s see everything in slow motion? So I want to stay calm in the chaos. And if I freak out, my staff will freak out. And I don't want them to Because there's out. always chaos in an event. No matter what, no matter how big you are, no matter how smooth you are, no matter how many events you've thrown, there's always chaos because you're playing a game of minutes. If one person's over by seven minutes, it, it messes up other things. If the audiovisual speakers, this, this goes out, or the this is, thing is not working, the clicker's not working, like those things are going to happen. And you have to remain calm and try to find another clicker or scrap it. They're not going to use the clicker. The, the screen went out, try to get another screen or move on without a screen. Like there's only a couple answers for these problems and we can't freak out when something happens. So the, the sprinklers go off because of the fire. Okay, well get everybody out, get them some towels and get them back in here. Let's just, we got to move on yeah. because otherwise what are we doing? We're just going to cause panic and everyone's going to have their phone out talking crap. So we got to stay calm. What's the craziest thing that has happened to you in the event? Well, recently we did have the fire alarm went off oh. and we were about to do the pitch. It was literally like Andrew. Everybody was excited, ready to buy. Yeah, everyone's on the edge of their seats. Andrew's been pitching for getting ready to explain everything. And, you know, he has a great conversion rate because people want to be part of what he's doing with the mastermind. Like, it's perfect. And literally the same, like, two-minute window where he's about to be like, okay, guys, if you want to join us for the money is mastermind, like, blah, 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 the fire alarm goes off. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how I felt. And so everyone just freaks out, runs outside. And by the way, we're in a hotel that's like on the ocean. It's, you know, on the water. It's 70 degrees outside. The, the doors are all glass and they're everywhere. Like you could walk outside in 14 steps. So even if the fire, even if our walls were burning right now, you could walk right out. Nothing would go wrong. And obviously there was no fire. There was no smoke. There was no nothing. Someone just pulled it. And so... That was crazy. That was very recent, actually. Yeah, crazy. So on the speakers, how do you decide, uh, how do you deal with egos? Oh, right. uh, yeah. Like speaker <laughs> egos? Yeah. Uh, and, and how much minutes they get, or if they're not, maybe they're unhappy because they're going to be in a, um, they're going to be sitting down in the, what is that called? A the, panel. In a the, in the panel, and yeah. they're like, I'm too good for a panel. I should be speaking, or I should get an hour. Yep. I'm not happy with my, my or I want to speak last, or like, how do you, does that ever happen? It happens every single day of my life. Because uh, you, if you're having do all those events, I'm sure you, uh, you yeah. have a lot of headaches with different personalities. Yeah, so I have this rule. I don't negotiate with terrorists. Like, I'm explaining to them the scenario of where they fit. I know where they're supposed to be at. I know what I can and can't do. If I have them on a panel, it's because I can't fit them in a speaker slot. Sometimes they have a speaker slot because I can fit them in a speaker slot. But like, I'm having that happen this weekend and there's nothing I can do about it because this is the f amount of time I have. I have my th goals and things that I have to do for this event. And when I can fit them in for an individual speaker slot, of course I'll put them in. When I can fit my friend in to speak an event, I would love to have them there. But when I only have a certain a couple hours of window to, to fill in an event, I don't care if they want 45 minutes versus the 25 I gave them. It does, it's, it's math. I have to do this. Yeah. It's not an emotional thing. I have an event to run. It's a business. And it's not like a fun, like, oh, we're just having, you know, like, if I need you to be 25 minutes, it's 25 minutes. And by the way, it's not 25 minutes for you to go to 32 either. It's 25 minutes. And so I'm very strict about it. Even with my dear friends and people I respect and people I look up to and people that are gazillionaires, like, if I say 25 minutes, I promise you deep in my soul, when that clock turns red, I will walk on stage. You are coming off. You're not doing 32 minutes when I say 25 minutes. You are not. And Is I'm there ever a speaker that keeps going longer and you're like, uh, I'll, I'll let it slide? The only one I would let slide is Ed Milet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because his story is amazing. He's an absolute legend. And, you know, it, I know going in that he has so much passion to it. Um, and it's, it's Ed. He always goes long, huh? Ed Milet? Yeah, because it's, yeah. he's got a message. To, you know, he knows what his purpose is in this world. Yeah. And... And I want his message out there in the he's world. A good, he's a great closer, too. Yeah. Like, it, like it, it seems like he he gets better with, with each minute that passes by. And then that towards yeah. the end, he make, makes everybody cry and he yes. gets so emotional. He, he's just the best. And so, um, but outside of that, I'm just really, really strict. I have to be. Yeah. I, I, I need the efficiency of the event. And I need it to, if I go over by seven minutes in the morning, seven minutes can turn into a half hour later in the day. And I would literally have to pull someone's whole speaker slot. I'll give you an example. 
at our huge event, the Limitless event last time, I pulled my own speaker slot. Like my own speaker slot at my event for 7,000 people, I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. I was still interviewing and I, was still, I interviewed Gary Vee and David Goggins, like I still did interviews, but I took out my own speaker slot just to catch up time because of one situation. Yeah. And so I don't want that to happen, so I'm very strict about it in every single event. Yeah, and, and on, the, uh, on the events when you do them every month, how do you decide who's speaking in, in each event? Because let, let's say a year from now, do you want to bring back the same speakers or do you want to bring in like new faces? So it's, it's a mixture. There's some speakers that have to be every time, right? Me, Andrew, and Eddie are the founders of Spire Tour. We're going to be at every event. There's certain people that are sponsors for the year or part of the brand. Like there are speakers that I'm always going to have, like Tim Story or Tim Grover, um, Marcus Limonis. There's certain guys that are going to be at all the events. Mm -hmm. And then it's city-based, right? If we go to Dallas, Texas, I want Mark Cuban. If I'm going to be at this city or this city or this city, I want David Goggins because he's got a great audience there. If I'm going to be in this city or this city or this city, I want Gary Vee. There's certain characters that their following likes them from that city. A-Rod. Okay, well, if I have A-Rod, I want him in Miami. I want him in New York, which I have him in both. I want him in those cities because his audience is Miami, New York, etc. And so I want people based on their city because they're going to convert really well and it'll be easier for us on travel, right? Like yeah. we have Shaquille O'Neal in Orlando. Well, he was big for the Orlando Magic, right? We'll book certain characters based on a city as well. Yeah, and, and this event, the, the big one, do you ever want to do like a whole baseball stadium or football stadium that, that big? Or, or is it better, if, is it been better uh, monetary-wise if you keep it at like at 4,000, 3,000? So quality over quantity, or you want more qua uh, quantity? We, we will do some 7,000 to 10,000 person events. I don't know that a stadium would convert that well. And it was fun watching Grant Cardone do it. I, obviously, we both went. Like yeah. It's fun to see him do 30,000 people in Miami. That was in interesting. It didn't convert well, obviously, because how can you? You can't, you can't have an emotional connection in a baseball stadium where tens of thousands of people are there and thousands of people are talking, thousands of people are walking around. You can't control the audience. We're doing Madison Square Garden July 20th. That's a big venue, but it's still only 7,000. I mean, it's a lot of people, but that's manageable. Yeah. Uh, Last week of January in Houston, we're going for 10,000. Limitless Arena, April 27th, we're going for 10,000. Those are big arenas, big venues, but we can control the room because they're an indoor basketball arena. When you start to go to out outdoors baseball stadiums and football stadiums, I don't know that you could convert well. You could make money from just selling 50,000 tickets if you could fill it up, yeah. but that's a big gamble. You know? Now on the, on the conversion, uh, last thing about this, what, what kind of masterminds do you sell well, like what's the prices and, and is, do they get a deal when they buy at the event? Yes, yeah, so Money Is Mastermind is 15,000. We have 706 members. We added another 123 just last Sunday. So now we're at 800, 829. Um, that's 15K and they can bring a friend. They can bring a guest or a business partner or a spouse. So it's a very affordable mastermind and it'll be the biggest mastermind community in the world because we're adding over 100 per month. If they try to buy it outside of that, it's 20K and they can't bring a guest. So buying it in person is great. Cole Hatter has a 15K um, called Level Up, which is focusing on real estate. That's 15K. We have a 50K, which is the Chairman's Club. Um, we have 100K, which is the 100 million mastermind experience. And so from the events, we're selling into the 15Ks. Either it's mm -hmm. Money Is or Level Up, and that's Andrew or Cole. And then from there, people can upgrade to go to Operation Black site with me and Bedros or go to the Chairman's Club and learn about investing or go to 100 Million Mastermind Experience. When they upgrade, do they pay the difference or do they have to pay it on? The, they complete. pay the difference and they can get some type of a discount depending on Got it. when or how. And then the, like the 15,000 Mastermind, how, how does that work? What, what does it include? Uh, so we have multiple weekends pr per year that are in-person weekends plus the weekly coaching calls, et cetera. So it's all blended in. But it's really to build a big community, like yeah. getting these people that are business owners to talk with each other. When I... When I talk with you about doing a 25K mastermind, f your audience hanging out together is actually more valuable than just what they're learning. Mm -hmm. Them doing deals together. Yeah, that happens a lot. Like that's the community starts making deals together. Exactly. And, and, th and then they also invest. Of course. Like I learned that from you. Mm -hmm. So like I, I saw you um, in, like raising capital like for different things, getting, uh, getting people to like invest in yes. some other stuff. I know, I know the ranch, mm -hmm. uh, right? So. How important has that been in your life? Like, and how do you get people to believe in you and, and give you money like that? 
Um, believe in me is from track record because I, I do what's called building in public. Everything I do is visual. Yeah. I'm going to show you videos. If I say I'm opening an Everbowl, Everbowl number 81, you're going to see me at the opening. Yeah. Everbowl 82, you're going to see me at the opening. Because when you, when you came here, you just told me, oh, I just, I just, I'm, I'm here, I just bought another business mm -hmm. ne next door to you. Yep. So like you're always <laughs> buying shit. I'm, I'm literally, when I leave here, I'm working on buying a company. That they did $18 million last year. It's a beverage company. And I'm hoping to buy them because they're already in t tens yeah. of thousands of stores. I like finding things that are already working, yeah. right? Like buying the business next door to you that's been around for years. Mm -hmm. I know I can make it bigger. I can just make it more famous and I can add in influencers, celebrities and models to go work out there and that'll make it bigger. If I can buy a beverage company that's already doing 18 million, I can get them more distribution. So like influencers, models, they'll get free access to your gym? Yes. And that's a strategy. It's a very good strategy. That works really good? <laughs> yeah. Should I get like models and influencers to do real estate and, and of course. <laughs> give, them, give them like a, a bonus or something yeah. just so that it recruits more people? Of course. It's just, it's eyeballs, right? Yeah. If you get models or you get influencers or you get ex-athlete to come in here, like you, I've seen you have famous boxers here all the time. Like imagine your famous boxer is posting about a listing. You don't know. They have right. lots of ballers that follow them. They have lots of people. They have people that are broke, rich, everything in between that follow them. But if they're at like a listing and you're yeah. selling a $4 million house, you don't know. Yeah. The risk is very low, right? You're well, paying them X to post about well, it. Well, you just introduced me to a rich Mexican friend. Yeah, uh, sure. That <laughs> wants to do business. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, and, and that's all relationships. So you, you've gotten a, you're like the connector, right? You, you know everybody. Like whenever I, I need uh, somebody, I'll be like, hey, Dan, uh, do you know this person? Uh, what, what would it cost? And you, you know all the answers. You're like, oh, this, but I can get it for this. Oh, yeah, yeah. So like how important has that been and, and also, you said track record. What's, what's the, what kind of track record and how many years of experience do you need for people to start believing in you? Because I'm, I know that 10 years ago, I, could be, I couldn't tell people, hey, come pay 5K for a one day mastermind course, yeah. and invest six figures in uh, this business that I have. Like, w I don't have a track record, I don't have the experience. How long did it take for you to get to this level and when is the time to race capital and where people believe in you like that? So I'm old, you know, I've done this for 25 years. I started when I was 17, I'm 42 now. And so, you know, I started my company, I was in 55,000 stores. So for beverages, people saw that. I started a poker site, it was a top five poker site in the world. People saw that. I started my social media agency and I post about it all the time. When I started investing in Everbowl, there were 17 locations, then 18, then 23, then 30, then 40, then 50, then 60. So if I post about Everbowl and people are watching me open stores left and right and watching the company grow, that's a track record. I opened up Cards and Coffee, I opened up one by myself, then two, then I raised money. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, boom, right? I didn't raise money until I opened up this, I was done with the second location. I'd already done 10 million in sales before I raised any money with Cards and Coffee. And so the same concept applies across the board. I prove it first and now people can see and believe in me and now they want to co-invest with me. So if someone's out there like, I fixed one flip, if they did one fix flip, it's hard to get someone to want to put money with them. That's gambling, right? But if they've done seven, me and Albert want to put some money in, right? Your likelihood of doing well in number eight is pretty good. And then you do 12 and then 19 and 35 and then 100, blah, blah, blah. We want to invest with you and it's easier to raise money when someone shows that they've done it over and over and over. Can you raise money for your first fix and flip? You can. It's gonna be pretty tough and your conversion rate's not gonna be as high. People are not gonna be sure if they're gonna do it. And you're not gonna get it right because how can you? You don't know all the details yet. But if you're doing number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, a lot of people wanna invest in you. You gotta show it publicly though. Yeah. Are, are you making more money than ever right now? I'm making more money and deploying more money than ever. Like I, my sp spending is insane because I'm nonstop investing, nonstop, yeah. like nonstop. H how much are you spending every month right now? 350,000 a month. Because my, the ranch overhead is 140,000 a month. The Amex average is 155, I know exactly because I happened to talk about this recently. 155,000 a month on the Amex on average. And then travel. So you got a, about 300 grand a month between the ranch and the Amex and then travel. So it ranges from 350 to 400K a month of just like overhead, of life yeah. of just stuff. But at the same time, as capital is coming in, I try to go buy the gym next door to you. I try to go buy a coffee company. I try to go buy this business. I could invest in this thing. Like I'm deploying capital all the time in between there. And so when you ask if it's making more money now than ever, 
there's a lot of capital coming in left and right, but I'm deploying it, deploying it, deploying it, deploying it, deploying it at all times because to me, it's just planting seeds. But your top line revenue overall is like, like uh, huge. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. You, <clears throat> most people, maybe their net income or their EBITDA is, is pretty good, but they're not, their revenue, their top line is not that great. Like you build so many businesses, partner up on so many businesses that like let's say one thing goes wrong or two things go wrong, yeah. you still have a lot of cash coming in from all different places, right? Yes, so I set my life in a way that each of my businesses do between 10 and 40 million each. And so whether it's Master My Business, which is, does a lot more than that now, because we scaled so much, Cars and Coffee has done 31 million in sales, Everbowl does 20, 30 million bucks a year in sales. So it's masterminds, sports cards, events, speaking, obviously I'm speaking over 100 times a year, um, besides the you know, my own events. And so each thing is its own category. Yeah. And my goal is how do I find a bunch of different companies that are c I can do 10 million, 24 million, 18 million, 19 million, 35 million, et cetera, that no one thing can hurt me, like you said. If I go try to build a hundred million or $200 million company, that's hard because I'd have to go all in on one thing. I'm not all in on any yeah, one yeah, thing. Yeah. I want to be running a bunch of 10 to $40 million size companies over and over and over. Like you said, if this one, something slows down or something doesn't work or something needs more capital, that's okay because this and this and this is working. Yeah. Rather than one huge company that takes all my time, I, I'm just not in that mode anymore. I did that in my former life. Yeah, you, you know what I notice, uh, like very clearly, like from you, like versus years ago, you have like the spark, like you, you, you right. just seem like, you just seem like happy or yeah. for some reason, uh, like, like, like happier, like, like, I don't know, like excited, happy. That's what I meant in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, you're even having the drink with me. Usually you don't, you don't have I, a drink. I don't, I don't drink. And, and you're drinking place, some <laughs> vodka there. <laughs> but, but um, uh, like, what, what is that spark? Is, is it that you're going to become a father? I mean, that's exciting because I've been wanting that for years. Uh, the spark is the game. I'm just excited now. Like I can, I literally I can see the matrix right now. I can feel it and see it. And I'm doing all these things that I like. What's a matrix in your, in your words? The matrix is, I walk in here and I can tell you, oh, you know, you should move these podcast things over here. You should probably put the light over there. The microphone, like I can see what to do or change or uh, adapt. Yeah. I walk into an event, I can tell them, oh no, you should definitely move this over here. Don't have the chairs here. Like, I feel like I can see the things for a business, financial reports, an event, a run of show, an Everbowl, a restaurant, a, whatever I'm working on, I feel like I can see the things to improve, fix, change, because it's not just from what I've seen and experienced, I get to learn from you and this person and this person, I'm in the room with all these other people, what they're doing with their businesses. And so I can see it and analyze things yeah. really quickly. So when I say the matrix, I just feel like I can see all the X's and O's of what's a fix and change on something. Got it. And what does it mean to you to be a father? Like, it, cause you're, you're as busiest as ever in your yeah. life, right? And now you're going to be a father. It's, um, I've been wanting for years. And I thought I would slow down when it happens. I don't know yet because I'm only four. She's only four and a half months pregnant. So I don't know yet. Um, but I'm ex I don't know. I want to just take the baby with me and I want to like make a little boss baby and like <laughs> make her an influencer, you know, make him whatever the baby is, whatever the sex is. Yeah. Like I want to make that baby. Cause, cause you don't, you don't, you, you don't know yet. Like the, the gender the, yet. The gender reveals uh, April 10th. Did you like, did you want like uh, a boy or a girl or, or were you when were you um, just I had whatever? I had feelings for both. Like I wanted yeah. a boy so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have a boy. And I was like, you know what? A girl would be super cute and fun and like, you know, they can have uh, the girl, Erica, who's the baby mama. Like she's gonna, she can make a little pretty girl and have fun and dresses. And then if there's a boy, I'm like, hey, we're on a ranch and let's be a cowboy. Like either way, I'm happy. And maybe we'll just have- the Baby's gonna be uh, half Brazilian. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be an exotic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby. but and growing up on a ranch full of animals, so it's gonna be interesting. So, so on the so when I had my my first baby, my my girl Italia, she's seven already. Uh, like you get attached to them, so you want to be with them the whole time. You want to see them like a lot, and you travel a lot. Yeah. Uh, have you ever thought about like how it's gonna how is it gonna work with all the traveling? Am I gonna take her with me? Uh, am I gonna be like maybe 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 you need a jet to start flying around because you yeah. you travel a lot. What, what's your what is your um, how are you gonna process that once baby is born? I really don't know yet. Yeah, I I know that 
in the beginning, there's not as much work for me as there is for mom as far as like the baby doesn't need me that much. So I want to see the baby, but I don't know how much I can actually do and care for. And I don't want to make any mistakes either. So I'm going to let Erica and my mom's going to be there and her mom's going to be there. There's gonna be, her sister's going to be there. There's going to be a whole house full of girls taking care of uh, the baby. Um, and so I like to be there to do my part, but I don't really don't know how much I can actually do. Yeah. But when that baby starts talking, like, I want the baby with me. I'm going to put him in the backpack. <laughs> like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know yet. I want to see. You Everyone tells any, me. Any, any parenting tips you could oh, yeah, always reach I out? Definitely. Um, I just, I just know that once it, once the baby gets here, um, people keep telling me like my life changes. And so I have an idea in my head, but as you probably know better, I, I don't know until it happens. And so yeah. I don't want to act like I know something that yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, so er Erica's your, your girl. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you posted a, a, you posted a pic and it said that, um, 13 years ago. Yeah. 2011. You, you mind sharing the, the story, how you guys met and all that? Uh, so we met in 2011. She w just moved here. Yeah. Um, from Brazil. From Brazil. Yeah. So she didn't speak English or not really. I mean, how'd you communicate? <laughs> like using the app, like Google, <laughs> um, and so we hung out a lot back then. And then I got a girlfriend, she had a boyfriend. Both of us became single again. We hung out again, same thing. She had a boyfriend for a couple of years, I had a girlfriend. It was just like in between life. And, we, and then for many years we were just friends and she was in like a three year and a three year and a two year. So she, you know, and we just always talked and she has millions of followers. And so she was under my agency. She would do social media campaigns for us all the time. And so she would come to the events and we we're just friends for many years. And then I became single last summer, last June. And then after like September, October, like four or five months later, um, it just kind of rekindled and we were traveling and now there's yeah. a baby coming. <laughs> 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 no, that's awesome. Uh, very excited for you. So, so on the, on the, you're buying a, a gym here. Yeah, Rumble Boxing. The you closed on that already. Or? Yeah, we're just changing the utility bills today, really. And um, maybe I'll cancel my Equinox membership. Just start going. Yeah, to it's right down the street. Come on over. Um, and so yeah, it's uh, the co-founder. His name is Noah. He started it with the guys from Catch. You know, Catch Steak and Catch. Mm -hmm. uh, the, him and those guys were the investors. And they opened up LA and New York Rumble Boxing and had Justin Bieber and DJs and celebrities and everyone going there. And then they built it up. A private equity group bought it. And so became huge they have like i think like 80 locations that they've sold already and the company owns a bunch of their own locations and they have a bunch of franchises and then noah lives in the same building you know right next to you right next door to you as the rumble boxing and he was like hey what do you think about buying the original location with me I was like, yeah of course i love it and you live there so it makes it cool and you're the original guy that's great and no one knows everyone and so the last few months we we're working out the deal and then we've signed it a week ago and we're changing the bills, literally the utility literally right the second today. And um, to me it's fun because if I can prove the model of scaling that, maybe I can buy other ones because they own a bunch of other locations or the VC firm that owns it, they have like 2000 different gyms. They own different brands, I don't know, nine, 10, 11, 12 different brands, totaling over 2000 locations. And so if I can show them, hey, this is what I can do, Elevator Studios, uh, my agency, this is what Elevator Studios can do on this one location on Sunset Boulevard, what I could do for your other yoga places or stretching places or gyms, et cetera. Yeah. And if not, I'll have fun with this one location. It does six figures a month. It, it, maybe I can, I, it's never going to do a million a month, right? But if I can make it do six figures a month and out of one location, it already does that. But if I can make it healthier. Is that six, six figures net? A gross. Or in gross. gross, or gross. Yeah, yeah. What, um, what what is what is the the net in in the gym uh, more or less? So the overhead is high on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, uh, as you know, oh yeah. anybody because your rent is insane. Uh, our rent's insane there, but the margins are high because it's expensive to be there. I'm gonna increase the revenue on the place because I'm gonna add Everbowl inside of it. I'm gonna add in. Oh, that's smart. I'm gonna add in IVs. I'm gonna add in other you know cold plunge and sauna. Everbowl's your other company. Exactly. If I converge them together, fantastic. So. Kind of like everybody that needs a house, needs a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just looking at it. If I can take something that's already doing the low six figures a month, what are things that I can do to add more sales? All right, let's add in first form protein supplements. Oh, there you go. Let's add in Everbowl. Let's add in IVs. Let's add in, you know, let's add in these other things that fit into 
the perfect, what's called an avatar. Who is the avatar? Who is the customer that goes to Rumble Boxing? Great, what do they want? Food, supplements, meal. Oh, they want meals? Let's put in Icon Meals. We put in three million bucks in Icon Meals. That's a great investment. All right, well, let's take Icon Meals, put our refrigerator. Now people can buy frozen meals to take home with them. And so I'm just looking at the square footage of how can I make more revenue from the same customer of things that they want. And if I can prove that out, then maybe we do those same things in a bunch of other Rumble locations right. or the other businesses that the venture capital firm owns or another firm owns. They'll just see what I'm doing. So I'm going to do what I said, building in public. I'm going to show next week a photo of me. Hey, guess what, guys? I bought Rumble Boxing. Not the whole company, obviously. Yeah. I don't want to just be clear. I bought Rumble Boxing in Sunset Boulevard. Hey, guys, look, we just added this. We just added Everbowl. Hey, look, we added merch. Hey, look, we added IVs. Want to come in for an IV? Hey, look at these influencers getting IVs. Look at these influencers having Everbowl. Look at these influencers having first form supplements. Boom, boom, boom. I just build in public. And then along the way, maybe other things come up. If they don't, whatever. I'm just going to increase the revenue on this one place. If they do, great. I can now do it for other locations. So that, that's going to be you and Noah? Yes. And, and then do you feel like it, top line revenue is what you should focus on? Because you could always cut certain things and, and, tr and improve the margins. Yes. You focus more on top line? So I look at a company's gross revenue because uh, the top line revenue, because I know I can fix things. I can right. get things cheaper. I can cut out certain employees or executives that may not need to be there because there's overlap, meaning I have them. I can take out their accounting firm because I have an accounting firm. I could take out their CFO or this person because I don't need that part. I could take out this, this, and this. So I can save costs. So if a business is already netting 15% and I can increase it to 25% just, big, by, yeah. just by cutting some things out and I can add in upsells, right? I can increase the price on this. I can add in upsells for this. Now something that's doing 150 grand now does 210 grand, but the overhead went down, you win, right? Now do that a bunch of times. So, so what is the cost of the membership there and, and how many members do you have in that location? Um, that location has 160 on like the high end version, which is I think uh, 200 bucks a month. And then you can pay per classes, which is like 20 to 50 bucks, depending on the type of classes. And the, in general, it grosses the low six figures a month. And with these changes, I would like to do, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a month on a consistent basis. And to me, again, if I can keep the overhead the same, because obviously employees stay the same, rent stays the same, utilities stay the same. The core of it always stays the same. If I can keep that overhead staying the same, and then I can add supplements, meals, Everbowl, snacks, drinks, et cetera, then it becomes And the influencers or, or models, yeah. they're in for free. They're watching this. Some of them will be paying for it, <laughs> but yeah. the ones that work with us, yes, they'll be in there for free. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not like a c anyone can just come because they're an influencer and come work out for free. There's plenty of influencers that go there and pay. Yeah, yeah. From our agency, we have influencers that work with us that will do trades. And Got it. Also, they have to post about it. It's not like you can just show up and just because you're there, it's okay. Yeah. Because again, we only have, just like with a speaking event, there's only so many slots, right? I only can have 60 people per class. I have 30 of the big boxing, uh, the big boxing bags, and then 30 of the workouts with the weights all in the same room. So I can only hold 60 at a time. And so there's only so many hours in a day. And so I can only have X amount of members in total. Right. And so I can't just fill it up with half influ influencers so, and models. So is this, is this gym only boxing or do you offer other things besides boxing? Only boxing. Only boxing. Yeah, there is uh, weights in there, but it's not mm -hmm. like a traditional gym at all. It's not meant for that. So it's more of having the boxing workout. One Classes. of the best workouts. Classes, yeah. yes. And it's fun. When you see it, it looks like a nightclub. We can walk over there. It looks like a nightclub in there. It, they spent millions of dollars building this place. It's really cool. Are you going to be there often or, or are you, you plan being there once a week or how often? I'll be there whenever I'm in L.A. Yeah. You know, whenever I'm in L.A., I'll be there. But Noah lives in the building. It's amazing. And so to have an operator that lives and breathes the brand, he's so cool and all tatted up and works out and boxing for years and knows everybody, like, it's the perfect setup for me. Yeah. And if he wants to open up locations two, three, four, five, six, or when I say open up, like, go take over more locations, I'm in because... He's the founder. So why wouldn't I bet on that person? That's right. what I like to do, right? I want to bet on the person. So Noah was the founder of the, uh, of the Rumble? Uh, yes. Yeah? Yeah. And, and for the, there's no other boxing gym around here, right? Uh, not that I'm aware of. It's mostly like Equinox and other types of gyms. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of gyms in the area. But do you think you could get some of those people to join Rumble? Yeah, because it's not either or, it's both. Yeah. You know, you can work out at Equinox and that's an amazing gym, right? But if you want to go through a boxing class 
and have like an amazing experience, uh, it's a different version. Is there a limit on how many members you could have or? So I can fit 60 per class. Classes are 45 minutes. I might increase that to one hour. Um, and so, and we're open from morning till night. So, and we can go later. And late, late night classes are fun, especially for boxing. It's, especially with the cool factor of who's in there. Especially like, if you're stressed out or your wife pisses course. you off. It's a great place to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what, what about Everbull? Uh, how, how's that doing? Yeah. So I own 17 out of the 83 locations, me and Cole Hatter do. And then 2018, I put in 500,000 back when there was around 20 ish locations. And I just bet on Jeff Fenster. Whatever he was going to do, I was going to bet on him, right? And Dave Meltzer introduced us. I believed in Jeff because Dave Meltzer was like, yeah, I've known this kid for so many years. And so then I raised another million bucks from one of our friends. Um, he put in 500K, another friend put in 500K. A year later, I raised $5 million. I'm like, hey, let's scale this thing. Let's really go for it. And then, holy smokes, March 2020 happens. And the whole world shuts down, especially restaurants. Yeah. And uh, Jeff just figured it out. He called me. He was like, what should I do with this, this, and this? I put him on the phone with Todd Abrams from Icon Meals. Icon Meals said, hey, you can make frozen acai. You can make 90,000 of them based on the inventory you have. Jeff's like, great. I'll start shipping frozen acai. Todd was like, hey, I can get you on to QVC. You want to sell on QVC? A week later, Jeff's on QVC selling 150,000 an episode in 11 minutes. In 11 minutes. A month before, he couldn't spell QVC. And now he's on there, boom, 150 grand, 150 grand, 150 grand. And so the bad thing that happened, which shut down most restaurants in our society, he turned into positive. He went and signed over 300 leases, went and got Drew Brees to buy 150 locations and put millions of dollars in the company. We raised $15 million more, all during chaos. Where everyone else is shutting down and crying, we went and went for it. 300 leases, new investors, new partners, franchises all over the place, QVC, all the action was happening during chaos. And so betting on the founder, betting on the person is what's amazing. And now we open one new location every six days. We're about yeah. to finish 45,000 square feet in Atlanta in three weeks from now. That 45,000 square feet will help us open a new location every three days. We just got Jason Tatum from the Celtics. He just put seven figures into the company to buy up a bunch of locations. We got Kamar Uzman, the UFC fighter. Like there's just so much action because math and time compounds. You just keep doing the thing over and over and over and over. You think over. that's going to be like your your big? It's going to be big. Billion. It's going to be big. Billions. I don't think we get to billions. Cause I think we'll sell before that, but that is going to be big. I mean, it, it's a foregone conclusion because those locations only cost a couple hundred grand to open. I can open one for 160, 120, 150, 180. Like, so even if like four closed for some reason, okay, I'm gonna open four more in the next month. And how much, month. Do those how much do those generate in a month? So they average around 160 to open. They range from 450,000 to 800,000 in gross sales um, with around 22 to 28% profit margin. The- 800,000 in, in sales uh, a year? Or a year, a year. A year. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of them do more, right? Like yeah. San Diego State does over a million dollars. I think it's like 1.2 million. Like some locations. And, and what do you what do you sell there? Just acai bowls. We are increasing the revenue, similar to what I talked about with Rumble. We're increasing the revenue because now yeah. we're going to add in soups and salads. And so now when someone goes there, maybe they don't want an acai bowl, or maybe their friend that's with them doesn't want one, but they want a soup or they want a salad or they want a smoothie. We're offering other things now, which will increase it. So we have a 2.5. We did a 2.0 version. This is a 2.5 version, which is offering food. So I think locations that used to do six or 700,000 will do eight or 900,000. Just from adding like sandwiches or soups and salads and basic things like that, I think will increase a lot of revenue. But yeah, that'll be a huge one because the company has a ton of capital. We're opening locations left and right. We barely ever close a location because we're really picky about finding the right spots. The overhead is low because there's no kitchen. There's no chef. There's no cook. So our overhead is low because we can have 17 year olds and 22 year olds working there making acai bowls with one or two employees at a time. And so we're much more profitable than other restaurants, which is why I like it, is the fact that our overhead is low, the build out is low, the construction is low, we don't need a kitchen, we can just crank them out. And so now the thing is, how do we open other things like it, right? I've been thinking about doing a pizza brand, you know, like pizza, because I love pizza, and thinking about doing a pizza brand. We're already building all of Shaquille O'Neal restaurants, his chicken restaurants, we build for Shaquille O'Neal. Like we're building other people's restaurants. And so once you get the flow of something, and you get into the zone of it, you start to think about how can I either increase revenue here or how can I do things that are similar to it? Yeah. And you talk about chaos. Yes. Uh, 
I, I love chaos because I see a lot of opportunity because competitors get weak. Oh yeah. Uh, how do you feel about chaos? Like, do you like, do you like and enjoy when everything's working out to perfection? Versus, uh, do you like when there's a lot of chaos and you gotta really, really figure things out? So I like it all. I just like the game. I like the action. I'm happy when things are quiet and calm. And, and let me let, let me add a little bit to it, because right now real estate and mortgage are going through chaos. Sure. What I mean by that is there's a lot of sellers or, or owners of ho homes that they don't want to sell their home because they have a 2%, 3% interest rate and they don't want to sell and then have to buy something else right. at a 7%. Right. Another thing is nobody wants to refinance because they have a really low rate. So it slowed down a lot of the a lot of the production and now they're bringing out this uh, new new rule where now selling agents can be paid. Have you heard about that? But but now because there's this big lawsuit that happened, so now only listing agents can get paid, and and selling agents can get paid. There's a little twist uh, sure. around that. It's like I, I have the answer to that. Yeah. But a lot of agents, a lot of loan officers, they're they're panicking and it's chaos. So they're closing. They went from closing. 10 deals a month, 15 deals a month, to like one deal a month or two deals a month or one deal every other month. So their income is down. They're not, they're not able to pay their bills anymore. So there's a lot of chaos or they're leaving, they're jumping from company to company for 5% more, 10% more that they're gonna make in the, in the other company. So then the, and then mortgage is a low, low margin business. Like you don't make a lot of money in mortgages unless you have a good comp plan and you understand. So it's just a lot of chaos going sure. on, people just going crazy, going cuckoo, and, and, but it's a great, it's been the best time for me because I see it as opportunity and I've been taking advantage of certain things that I have yeah. going my way. So in, 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 <clears throat> that, um, in that way, how do you feel about like chaos versus the easy times? So in scenarios like this, a lot of your competitors are gonna fade away, right? A lot of other companies are gonna move to other verticals or just disappear completely because um, they can't handle it. They can't handle the stress. Or they don't have the finances. They don't have, they can't handle not making X amount of dollars per month because they didn't save anything. And so you're gonna have less competition which will then increase the sales for a lot of people that work for you because there will be less loan officers and less mortgage people and less sales reps and less sales agents and less listing agents because a lot of people will fade away um, to go switch to other careers or other, other verticals. At the same time, these are the opportunities to look for what can I do within our space, right? You already have sales, mortgages, et cetera, but could you start a notary company? Could you start being the one that does staging for homes? Like if you look at your spend on a actual purchase of a house or a mortgage deal, who do you pay, right? If you just yeah. look at all the line items. Like escrow, title, right. insurance. So do you ha end up coming up with your own mortgage company, escrow company, title company, notary company? Like literally look at the list and think about, can I start any of these companies that are on the list or all the companies that are on the list? And whatever ones I can't, could I do like a 50-50 joint venture or an 80-20 in my favor? Like what are deals I could do with other smaller ones because you're famous? Can I go to someone and say, hey, you already have a notary company. You're in four cities. I can get you in 30 cities because I'm Albert, right? Me and Sylvia can make you famous. And you take over a chunk of their company because they already have a notary company. Or do you just go start one on your own? Can you do an insurance or a title company? Maybe you find someone that already has a title company doing X amount of sales. We're like, hey, Albert, the mortgage guys, we can make you more famous. We can scale this business. Look at how big we are. And you're already doing 8 million bucks a year. I can help you go to 20 million a year, but give me right. X. And so in these times when people are stressed out, there are a lot of deals that become available. And what I do in these times is I look at, just like I said with Everbowl, when, when things got quiet, we're like, okay, what can we do? Oh, we can sell frozen versions of our acai bowls. Who can do that for us? Oh, Todd, Icon Meals, he sells frozen meals. Oh, Todd, he, boom, we make 90,000 meals. Hey, Todd, he gets us on KVC. Oh, boom, we're on TV. Like, that all happened from chaos. You might find a notary, insurance, title, all the things that are around you that you spend money with or you work with and say, hey, I'm gonna start that company or I'm gonna buy that company or I'm gonna merge with that company or do a deal with that company or joint venture or affiliate commissions or something because you wanna have more revenue streams within your own category so that you are fully integrated. 
from the second someone walks in to the someone, second someone gets a loan or leaves, how do you make money on every single step of the way? Yeah. And then also you're connected with a lot of people. You have a lot of friends that are like big time, people with a lot of wealth, uh, and you have a huge following, right? So if somebody's watching this and maybe they don't have that right now, maybe they're, they've been timid, scared, insecure, and they haven't wanted to get on, onto social media and build their personal brand, what advice would you give these beginners on starting their personal brand from zero followers? So consistency wins, right? You just making content and you doing content with other people will get you your initial followers. Hashtags don't really work for someone with a big following, but at the beginning it works for people that, when people are searching hashtags. You liking and commenting and interacting with a bunch of other accounts will work to help you start to get initial followers because people like when you like and comment. It doesn't matter how big you are. I see when people comment on my stuff. You see when people comment on your stuff. And you see the people that are consistent. And so you interacting, you engaging with people on their accounts, small, medium, or large, it'll get people interacting with you. But the reason to build a personal brand is it gives you access to investors, partnerships, events, fun things, cool things, people wanting to work with you, people wanting to hang out with you, relationships, everything in between happens from you having a personal brand. And you don't have to have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of followers like Albert. You having 3,600 followers in the real estate space, it can help you make money. You've got 7,000 followers and you're a personal trainer, you can make money. Like you don't have to have hundreds of thousands of followers. It's just being consistent and posting content that's real. If you post content that's real, especially if you watch the way Albert does it, where he's literally showing his real life, his, his full life. When you make content like that, people trust you. I get a lot of criticism though. Of course you do. So does Jay-Z. So does Beyonce. Think about it. If we walked outside and interviewed 100 people that drove by, half people think Beyonce sucks, half people think Jay-Z sucks. All of them are stupid. But it doesn't matter. They just want to hate on Jay-Z or hate on Beyonce. They want to hate on success. So when you post a Ferrari, when you post a cool watch, people are going to hate on you. Doesn't matter how you got it, you could be Mother Teresa. So you don't, you don't feel like I should be a softie for the brokies? <laughs> <laughs> no, you be you. You have fun being you. And people that, people that will like it will buy into it. People that hate it will talk about you. And so, now, does it mean you have to poke at someone to make them hate you? No, you don't have to in instigate it, but you're living your real life. You literally built what you say, right? You showcase, and you talk about the bad stuff too. So. You're, you're not faking it like most of these guys are out there that are doing it, right? They, they go rent the Ferrari to, to go fake something. You're like, hey, this is when I couldn't afford it. This is when I went broke. This is when I made money. This is how I did it. This is what Sylvie and I did. This is what we had to do. This is hard. This is good. Like, you show the real life. And so that makes people feel an affinity to you. That makes people feel emotionally attached to you. Well, what do you think people get triggered? And, if, and w once they get triggered, if they start commenting nasty things, like I'm sure you've gotten a few nasty comments, right? What, do you reply to them or do you ignore them or, or how do you deal with comments, whether I, they're good or bad? I swipe this little button this way and I click block or restrict. They're being like disrespectful. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm not gonna engage with them. I, I have a very short lifespan. Yeah. Right, we're here for 100 years and we're out. God willing, we're here for 100 years, right? Yeah, yeah. Probably 80 or 90 years. And so why am I gonna spend 17 seconds responding to Johnny444? Johnny444 just wants a response. He doesn't even most of the time agree with what he's saying. He, when he says, oh, that car is rented, even though you showed a picture of you at the dealership with the, the permits and like the registration, yeah. he's just saying that so you respond. He probably doesn't even believe it. Oh, Sylvia's not even your wife. You just met her. Okay, bro. Like it's been 15 years, 10 years, whatever. You're like, they're just saying it to get a response. It doesn't have to be true to them. They just want you to yell at them, respond to them, et cetera. And so I don't engage with that. I have a very short lifespan. I just want to block them or delete them. Yeah, smart. Now to close out, Dan, cards and coffee. Yeah. H how is cards and coffee doing? So we've done 31 million in sales. Uh, Gary V named it, that's how it all started. I brought in a bunch of interesting characters, Steve Aoki, Post Malone, football players, Marshawn Lynch, all these guys as part of it. And just really trying to build the first true national chain store in the space and be live streaming uh, the coffee breakers. We live stream 24 hours a day. Because you're very passionate about, about yeah. cards. I love it. Yeah. Because I did it when I was a kid and then, you know, 30, 40 years later, it's, I get to do it again, but now I have more access to you know, a lot more cards. And so I just love the game. Um, I love the action of it, and I see what people are doing right and wrong in the space so I can build all these stores. And so my goal is just to keep finding more locations, find more stores, find good partners, and build a true national chain store in the space. And I'm building this one to sell. A lot of companies I build, aren't. there's not a plan to sell them. I would sell them, but I'm not planning to it. Cards and coffee, I'm building to sell. 
I want to build an infrastructure that has a whole bunch of stores and a whole bunch of sales, tens of millions of dollars a year in sales, that I can sell that company. So you're going to sell that one and Ever, Everbull? Everbull has had offers, but we are not actively trying to sell it because we have such a clear path and there's very little it's risk. It's a good cash flow, huh? There's very little risk on that one. We can open up locations every six days and then soon every three days. Because then if you sell, then you have a good chunk of cash, but then you lose the cash flow. I would deploy that cash the same week. Oh, you would? If I got tens of millions of dollars from Everbull today, it wouldn't last me a week. It would be gone. Would you ever buy a jet? I rent them all the time, but I don't really have a reason yeah. to buy one. The upkeep on them is a headache. And uh, they, they, need, they go stuck in repairs for one or two months at a time. Like, I've never heard one friend of mine that has jet ever like, yeah, I love it. They love the jet when it's working, but they hate it when they're like, oh, it's in the shop for a month. It's in the shop for two months. Yeah, it's chartering is pretty cool. I have chartered hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. It's super simple, it's super easy. And I, I, when I want it, it's a text message away. I've been using the same guy forever. I have, the, I have 12 other backup people to him, but I use the same guy, Alex, all the time. I probably introduced you to him before too. Like he's my guy and I just use him all the time. And yeah. when I need it, I need it. When I don't, I don't. So when I want to fly Southwest, I fly Southwest. When I fly JSX, I fly JSX. When I need to fly private, I fly private. Yeah. It just depends on who I'm with, where I'm going, what the timing is. If it's timing related, I need a jet. Yeah. If I'm going somewhere and it doesn't matter when I get home, I can fly on JetBlue. Like if you're going with, with, your, with your new family, you're going to have to... I'll probably fly private, yes. Yeah. I'm not yeah. taking the baby on. Yeah. Well, that's here. awesome, Dan. <laughs> well, I'm really happy for you. Uh, really grateful you're my friend. Uh, thanks for all the support. Uh, thanks for everything you do. You're a great human being. And um, if people want to reach out to you, whether it's to invest in one of your companies, if people want to follow you, or, or they, they want to know how to partner up with any of the, your companies, where can they reach you at? Or so events? All, all my socials are all just Dan Fleischman. Um, and then from there, I, every platform is the same, just my name. You guys should have the same name and screen name and bio on your photos too, on your, on your profiles. And then my, everything we talked about today, I post about it. So you'll see it in my bio yeah. or you'll see me post about it. Yeah. Well, awesome, Dan. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Thank you.